Activists know this about the press, which is why the press must change. It's why journalism must change. Journalists must be inquisitive. Journalists must question everything, everything. Damn, sorry, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting nervous now because I am interviewing the most, man, the famous Megan Fox. No, oh, <laughs> stop it, stop it. I am, I'm nobody. No, I'm not that one. You don't have to be nervous. She's weird. That one's a weirdo. I'm a journalist. I'm a writer. I work for pgmedia.com where I write columns. Uh, I have been doing investigative journalism for 20 years, approximately, outside the mainstream press. I think the mainstream press does a pretty terrible job. Oh, some of them, some of them do a good job with <laughs> investigative work, but, but very few. I do a lot of coverage on family court issues, which is something that a lot of journalists don't want to cover because it's really difficult, difficult topic, yeah. a lot of trauma, a lot of family, um, you know, domestic abuse, child abuse, that sort of thing. Yeah. I've investigated CPS, Child Protective Services for years and the corruption that happens there and court corruption in, in general. And then I also have a fun side and I do, I have a YouTube channel, which was recently just totally demonetized for no reason whatsoever. But I have a YouTube channel where I, I do some entertainment news. Uh, and, and that's kind of how I got involved in the Johnny and Amber yeah. lawsuit. I'm interested in court and how the court process works. And when that case came around, I mean, I obviously had to cover it. It was just too good not to. <laughs> I completely understand. Um, yeah, I, I came in quite. I came in very late. I mean, six months after the case, so no one. Has oh. any, so no one has any excuse uh, to accuse me of this, which is what I'm going to ask you now. Did you start your your, your YouTube channel to spite Amber Heard? No, <laughs> no, my YouTube channel has been around for many years. I actually just had to go and delete a bunch of videos that I thought that YouTube was upset about because they won't tell you which ones so you just have to guess and so i went all the way back to the beginning and and i guess it was started in around 2004 or 2008 oh, wow. i was working on some local reporting so i did a lot of you'll see a lot of like really boring board meetings on my youtube page from ages ago one of them so there was the saga I wrote a couple of books. This one is called Shut Up, The Bizarre War That One Public Library Waged oh. Against the First Amendment. And this book is about libraries and public boards and how they use censorship to sign intimidation and police to silence people who want to come and tell them that they're doing something wrong. In this particular case, the library near me in Chicago, where I was at the time, was allowing men to watch pornography near children. Oh, my. Uh, in full view. And also, I, I don't know how to say this, pleasure themselves in, you know, they were allowing them to do this. And I found uh, through FOIA, you know, lots of documents that showed they never reported it to police. So the YouTube channel started out documenting this board, this library board, really, yeah. and what they were doing. And we would go every month and film them and they hated it. You know, because public bodies just hate being filmed. And then they would do things like write new policy to stop us from filming. And then we would sue them and we would win because you can't stop the public from filming a public body. I was talking about it. And you can see the proof on my YouTube channel of me going to the library, into the uh, young adult section and pulling these books and being like, I would call it young adult roulette because you could just pull them off the shelf and open them up and find the most disgusting crap in it from drugs to sex to um, just political nonsense in all of these books. Mm. So I had been talking about that for years. Um, at the same time, I was working at PJ Media. I was a conservative columnist. I still am. Uh, and my, my work really became more investigative through the library investigation. I want to say the first court trial I did cover was the Johnny Depp trial. Okay. I had live streamed before that, but I had never covered a trial. Yeah. I was watching other trial coverage, but I had so much to say that I was just like, I got, I, I just got to do it. I just got <laughs> it. And then I sat in my chair for eight hours a day for three months. Oh, you. And I, I mean, yeah. 
I covered the whole thing yeah. every day. And it was epic. It was fantastic. Since then, I, I covered the Gwyneth Paltrow trial, which was so entertaining. Oh, you think civil court is boring. It just it just isn't. And not when it's, you know, a celebrity and a guy with a narcissistic personality <laughs> disorder. It was fantastic. Going into the live stream aspect for a bit, did you have guests on when you were live streaming? Did did. You have, uh, like, like who did you have on because uh it's so weird that you were not in the recommended feed well at least on my feed but this oh that's was... not weird at all no 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 <laughs> we'll get YouTube, into that we'll, 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 youtube's been shadow banning me for years honey who did you have on there to get you shadow banned was it nick ricardo was it no it nick wasn't Quintus? nick i actually i actually didn't know nick when i started okay. i knew of him because i okay, had watched okay, the okay. i had watched his written house coverage yeah and i just thought his coverage was so good for writ the written house trial i yeah. was riveted every day and so i knew of him but he didn't know me i was who did i have on my sister who is an she's an attorney she does appellate law she does criminal law she does all kinds of different law any kind of law you can think of she ends up doing a lot of canine law which is funny um that's actually a she, thing uh, yeah that's a thing she's we saved a couple of dogs from death row a year or two ago <laughs> well from uh, being put down <laughs> yeah we saved them from being put down they were falsely accused of murdering big boy the cat <laughs> And really, it was the coyote who did it. And there was a trail cam video. It was very, it was exonerating video that wasn't used in the first trial. It had to be appealed. <laughs> so, 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 so it turns out that it 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 wasn't. So it turned out that it wasn't Butch that went after Tom. It was actually Wiley Coy Coy Coyote. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? It was Wiley E. <laughs> yes. And we were able to prove that. My sister was able to prove it. And she got those dogs released from death row. And they're back at home with their owner now. She would come on and give her legal opinion. I also had my friend Sean Colmeyer on. He's an attorney in Washington State. He's actually in a personal injury attorney. He specializes in bicyclists. That's a hard word to say. <laughs> and he's also a victim of family court. That's how I met him. Was oh, wow. that he is a victim of the family court system in Washington. And he's also an attorney. Okay. Uh, so if they can do it to an attorney, they can do it to anybody. So he would come on. And then I have my friend Gadfly, who is a YouTube music star. He's a He writes meme songs. And he wrote the one for the Johnny and Amber trial called Objection Hearsay, you might have seen it. Then I became a lawyer representing Amber Heard. Objection Hearsay. Oh my God, I don't have a case. Objection Hearsay. My sister was painting her office. We watched paint dry for a while. It was epic <laughs> programming. I mean, you was just that can't during, get that kind Was that during Amber's direct that you're watching paint dry? I just, I just got no, to it. No, it was like during during like the lulls, you know, and there'd be like recesses. What were we doing? We were watching paint dry. Oh, it was hysterical. Fair enough. My politics in my 20s was so much more rabid than my politics in my 40s. You know, I was so I was so sure of things at 20 and I thought Republicans were all good, you know, and and Democrats were all bad. And I didn't realize they're all bad. Like every single one of them is bad. They're all going <laughs> to screw you some one way or the other. Just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Uh, and and I worked on the George W. Bush campaign in, in, in Illinois. And, you know, I was so gung-ho. Now I think he's the worst person on earth. I'm so sorry that I did that. I was literally about to ask, who is that in the background? Like That's that's Rush. That's me. And look how young we both were. Look how young. I was, I was 22. And look how young he is. And I flunked out of ASU, but at UMUC, because I was like, well, I want to do this. Like, I, this is what I want to do. I got straight A's. I decided to stop and just keep working because, for one, I was paying for it myself. And it was very expensive. And I was newly married. And for two, I thought, I've learned everything I can learn here. I ran into a professor who gave us she was a journalism professor she also happened to be a producer for what's that show 
Mm, meet the press. That's what it was called. Meet the press. <laughs> So she was like a real working professional. And this was in 2004. The Republican National Convention was coming up. George W. Bush was speaking in New York City. And I was going to cover it for a website that I was working for at the time. I was actually traveling there yeah. to go cover it. And in, in the news, there had been death threats against George W. Bush, like serious ones. And they had arrested a guy. And it was all kind of, you know, iffy yeah. at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. This woman gives us an assignment and says, write a story, a news story, that George W. Bush is leaving the convention and is shot and killed by assassins. But that didn't I happen. Was like, no, it didn't happen. She <laughs> wanted us to write this fantasy story. And I, I pushed back. I said, I don't understand why we would do this. I think the Secret Service wouldn't appreciate it. And I also think that we should perhaps just, why don't we just do the Reagan attempted assassination? Here's a thing that actually happened. We're not making up things. Yeah. Why don't we just write about the attempted assassination? Oh no, she said, we, that was the assignment and we had to do it. So I called Rush <laughs> on the show one day. I called him, I told him about it. I told him about it and he was so funny. He goes, all right, Megan, I know what, you're, what you need to do. Write the story. But she, he goes, she didn't give you many parameters. Here's how your story goes. He leaves the convention. They fire shots at him and they miss. And Secret Service fires back, killing the would-be assassin, who turns out was your professor and was holding a copy of Al Gore's book, Earth in the Balance. <laughs> Did you write that? No, I didn't. End up oh, you should have. No, but guess what? No, worse, worse. The next day, she emails me. She heard it. She heard that because they all listen. Remember how Rush used to say doing show prep for the media? Well, all the producers of all the shows are listening to him. She heard it and she sent me this nasty email that said, <laughs> you need to take an, a course on ethics in journalism. Oh and I was God. like, me? me, I'm the you. one, you're <laughs> the one who wants us. You want to make up a story. You're talking to me about ethics. You're talking to me. Yeah, you want, to, you want to talk about assassinating a sitting president, but I'm the one with the ethics <laughs> problem. If you don't think there's anything wrong with your assignment, then why would you be embarrassed that 20 million people just heard about it? You know? <laughs> so I dropped out of that real quick. Is that when you joined PJ Media afterwards? Yeah, it was a few years later. And there is a fun backstory to PJ Media. The 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 founders, which would be God, I'm gonna Oh, play. you're gonna get fired. You're gonna, gonna get, get fired. fired. <laughs> I'll, 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 we will we will circle back. <laughs> we will Stephen circle. Green. Yeah, go, go on. Stephen Green. Stephen Green's the only one who's still there. Okay. And there were two others. The guy, Charles, who Oh, what was his last name? I don't remember now. He started Little Green Footballs, too. It was him and Stephen Green and Glenn Reynolds. Okay. And Glenn, Glenn doesn't really write for us anymore, either. I'm not sure if he's still involved or not. The way it got started, it used to be Pajamas Media. And the reason why it was called that, it was because they were the ones who broke the story about Dan Rather fake it, using faked documents to to smear George W. Bush about his National Guard service. Mm. And so there was this this thing that happened and Glenn Reynolds wrote a great book about it. It was called An Army of Davids because an army of Davids took down the mainstream media. And it was that like it was that catalyst, that mm. thing that happened. That was the first time the mainstream press got embarrassed by a bunch of bloggers in their pajamas. Okay, so is... these three guys got together and I'm they had, they started this pajamas media to make fun of Dan Rather. The whole thing <laughs> is just to mock Dan Rather because he was the one who was who said it was a bunch of bloggers in their pajamas and he was making fun of us. That was him trying to make fun of us. But we're the ones who took him down. We're the ones who showed everybody that 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 the media lies to you. And that's what PJ Media was founded on. And that's what PJ Media still does today. We show you the story that the mainstream press is hiding from you, intentionally hiding. And that brings us to Johnny and Amber, because the media intentionally hid the truth about that trial. 
Now, I've worked for mainstream media. Okay. ABC owned WLS and the four radio stations that I was with. And okay. then, Dis then Disney bought ABC. So I worked for ABC for several years. What's the difference? Well, for one, in a corporate environment, when you're at a corporate environment, you're going to have a whole lot of rules and regulations in place that don't exist in the independent journalism world. You're going to have people above you saying what stories you can cover and which ones you can't. Okay. Not that that's never happened in independent media because my bosses there are careful about what we print because they don't want to be accused of spreading fake news because we have to be very careful of big tech censorship, right? Mm -hmm. Censorship is a real is a real thing. And we have to be very careful that we get all our facts checked. But we're always careful about that. That's yeah. the difference. Mainstream press will just report this crap, right? And they don't have to back it up for whatever reason. If it's if it approved, if the narrative is approved, they can print unnamed sources say as if it's real. I can count on one hand the times that I've used an unnamed source, but it had to be vetted through my editor. So my editor had to be in touch with the source. My editor had to vet the source and see identification, like see verification that this person is a whistleblower and they actually work at the place. I can count on one hand the times that I've done that. You read in the mainstream press how many times they use unnamed sources. And I'm talking about the Washington Post, the, the New York Times, big, huge stories about Donald Trump and Russian intelligence and Russian interference. They're using all unnamed sources or sources close to the administration. Okay? Does this does this fall under media literacy? Like, you know, being able to, to decipher through this? Would that fall under media literacy? Yeah, yeah, I think yes. I think when you are a consumer of mm -hmm. news, you must pay attention to these things. And these are red flags. When you're reading an article, if you see unnamed sources, if you see sources close to the White House, disregard it immediately. Oh, okay, disregard. Okay, but, but how can you tell it's a legit source or is it or if it's an if it's a made up fake source? If it's a legit source, they'd name them. Period. What? Okay, but what if they want an anonymity, like those sources that, that, well, that are not Well, those sources, I just wouldn't trust any New York Times or any Washington Post or mainstream press with their unnamed sources because they've been proven to be total lies no, believe, so many times. Believe me, I've, now, read, I've, I've read a lot of case files. I know about the 2014 Rolling Stone article. I'm sure you, everyone must have known about that because that was the major focus of the, of, of the century. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Point, point is, a lot of people are just take on naming sources to be, oh, they don't want to go on record. Well, that might be true sometimes. Yeah. But when you're talking about White House gossip, that I guarantee yeah. you it's it's fake. OK, with this all happen? that shit about all that shit about Melania Trump and like sources close to the White House say that Melania Trump, you know, treats her employees badly or whatever. It's like, that's not a story that you need anonymity for. That's a stupid, if you don't really need anonymity, then you can assure yourself that that's a fake source. Okay. So if it's just a story about, mm -hmm. oh, somebody was mean to an employee, that's, you're not getting any backlash for that if it's real. If it's true, you're not getting, if it's a whistleblower, of course, in journalism, you're going to. But they rely on it so much with the Washington Post and the New York Times and NBC and CNN that I just don't think they're trustworthy. And I think the, the American public knows they're not trustworthy. I mean, come on. In the Johnny Depp trial, we had the L.A. Times reporting that Jason Momoa testified at the trial. It was a meme video. And they were too stupid and didn't pay attention to the trial to know that he never testified. They reported that as a fact. And these are the people that I'm supposed to believe? Okay. Cock ups. It, oh my gosh. I, 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 I know exactly what you're referring to. And I'm what I'm what I'm trying to what I'm trying to understand is reading between the lines of what's credible and what's not because i'm currently co co it's it's not it's similar but it's not the same but i'm currently co covering the, the jonathan majors case and a news report has just gone out in regards to the rolling stone and they have nine unnamed sources 
that claims that Jennifer Majors was pushing, was well, toxic in the past, that's one. They were worried that, that they would lose their jobs, that's two. And they were also, one of the sources disclosed that she signed an NDA with him. I, I don't have any media training, but I can already know from my other experience and studying that the NDA part is very questionable because I don't. F if you sign an NDA, you can't even speak that you sign an NDA. That's what I have always known. So, if you're reading stories like that, how would you take it as credible? Because they're alleging nine sources. They're alleging so many things. Like, like, like how would you... Well, look at all the women who came out as sources against Trump. I think they were all lying. I think every single one of them is a liar. I think Gloria Allred only represents liars. She is a political tool of the left. She's been used as a political tool to take down you know, prominent people on the right through false allegations. And that's what one of my books is about, actually. I think I have an entire chapter on some of Gloria Allred's people in this one, What's which is called? shut up. This is called Believe Evidence, the Death of Due Process from Salome to Hashtag Me Too. This is about all them lying, man. This is, this is, this is be crazy right here. <laughs> through literature and history, all the times women have lied to put men in prison, have them murdered, through, it, it, there's all kinds of reasons why. And as a, in America, the fact that the hashtag believe all women had any val validity at all. I can't believe the black men in America didn't stand up and be like, what about all those white women who lied to have us lynched <laughs> about lying about rape and we and, and our ancestors got hung, you know? Hey, 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 let's not bring out facts because we know how much they love and you know treasure facts so if you're reading this so i don't know about this uh case that you're referencing i haven't oh, read into jonathan no. majors but i'm looking at the rolling stone article on it right now i'm looking <laughs> at it because here's how i would read through this okay so i'm 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 reading through it i see that he was arrested for allegedly attacking a girlfriend yeah it says this week the new york post and the times both totally uncredible organizations <laughs> Well, the Post is a little better than the Times. Yeah, I Both know. reported that the New York Police Department has alerted officers that there is probable cause to arrest Major's accuser as well. Wow. <laughs> criminal case against... That's a red flag right there. So what do they have on her? The criminal case against Major's remains open and the allegations threaten to upend his career. The first public stain on an otherwise unblemished reputation. In dozens of new interviews with Rolling Stone, however, those who have known Majors over the past decade claim he has a history of abusive behavior. All right, well, that's a red flag to me too, because if that's true, why has no one reported it until now? Why does he have an unblemished career? And now all of a sudden people are like, oh yeah, dude's an abuser. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. I mean, during, I think we should always assume that whoever is being accused, especially in Rolling Stone, of being an abuser is probably a victim of abuse in some way. Uh, I will, I will say this because uh, I'm reading the tweets of of the Rolling Stone writer, and she did say that just because they didn't come forward first, that's usually how victims act because they don't. Yeah, they always say that though. <laughs> But look, when do we get to a point where, and I write about this in this book, okay, in the last chapter, this is, this is actually, this is a great chapter because at the end, I have in part three, it's called Battle Plan, and one chapter is called How to Harpy Proof Your Son to, to Avoid Harpies, who would do this to him, <laughs> and the next chapter is called How to Harpy Proof Your Daughter, and in that chapter it talks about how to raise your daughters so that they don't become lying wretches who would do this to someone and in one of these in in this chapter i talk about how to protect yourself from sexual assault and one of the very first things is if you can't avoid being assaulted you must preserve the evidence and you must come forward immediately there is no waiting 30 years or you won't see justice. And if you think you will, think again, because our court system is not set up to, to work on hearsay and 30 year old allegations. And the idea that, well, this is just the way victims behave. Train your kids better. 
train your children to not be victims. How about that? You can be you can be a survivor of sexual assault and not be a victim. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. How about we train our daughters to get DNA under their fingernails if they're if they are assaulted? And yeah. yes, we should train them in self-defense. We should get them guns and train them how to use them. At least in America here, we're allowed to have that. I know you're not, unfortunately, but some of us here in America are we allowed to shoot, shoot to kill. <laughs> yeah, you have knives. <laughs> we're allowed to shoot to kill here, and that's always preferable to being raped. But if you can't avoid the rape, well, there's things you can do. Scratch and claw like hell. Make sure you rip some hair out on the way. And then take that shit to the police. Go to the hospital. Don't take a shower. Don't wash your hair. Don't wash up. Go get the rape kit. Do, do the things you're supposed to do. Don't sit around and wait. Don't not tell people that we are so far past stigmatization of rape. Give me a break. I don't want to hear this from women anymore. I don't want to hear... But victims don't come forward. Then it's their own damn fault. Oh damn! Wow, we are going full victim blaming mode today. I'm yes, joking. Yes, full, full victim blaming. And, I'm I, I, look, I'm and like, then I'm that like, sucks because, like, I get it. Like, some women are like, "But I, you know, they have legitimate reasons why they're scared or whatever." But you must push through that. You must if you want justice. This leads me to my next point of understanding, of trying to understand how this old media la la landscape actually works. Because I read an article in regards to a Aziz Ansari, and we'll, we, we will link this back to that we heard in a bit. It was with Atlantic. One of, one of the writers was actually speak, echoing the same words as you, were, as you were echoing, basically just saying that, you know, like for some reason, Women are not women anymore. I think she, she brought up the 70s and was like, they were actually trained not to put themselves into compromising positions, uh, all those mm -hmm. things. And um, Don't walk alone at night. Don't do the... Yeah. But see, with the feminists, they, they killed all that. They said, well, teach men how not to rape. That's so absurd. <laughs> okay, because it, it, it is. It's so absurd. I mean, yeah, I have a son. Of course, I'm going to teach him not to rape women, okay? <laughs> that doesn't mean... That doesn't mean that rapists will cease to exist. Evil exists. There is a darkness out there. There's a predator in the bushes. We, it, it, to ignore that reality as the weaker species, you are a weaker sex, to ignore that. I have a quote in that book from Camille Paglia. Uh, Paglia. She is so wonderful. And Camille Paglia, she's a feminist, lesbian. You know, she's, she's on the left. Even she says this you go girl mentality that we have now is so naive it ignores the very real predator waiting in the darkness for you i looked at the goal of that article and i looked at the goal of the mainstream articles like the washington post and who allow because it was around, around the same case another magazine was not sorry not magazine another post was basically saying we have been warning uh, yeah i think it was washington post on this one uh, saying that we have been warning men like Anza uh, aziz ansari not to not to do this like they should take the hint basically so they've been so you can see the clear contrast with these two articles one is saying take the hint one is saying no be direct tell him no don't just yeah hint at him so what is the actual goals when it comes to journalism is it like what's, what's, <laughs> what's the actual the aim like I'll tell you what the goal of journalism is today in america okay the goal of journalism is to advance the accepted narrative that is being it's being sent down from blackrock and vanguard and and the companies that run the world and they own the media companies big pharma they own every media company out there and they are told what to say i'm sorry and they're told what to report and they're told what not to report their goal is to make their advertisers and their owners happy period <laughs> and that has nothing to do with journalism it has it has everything to do with corporate greed and nothing to do with journalism that's why i make no money that's why i'm broke and i wait tables on the side because 
I, I don't make money. I do real journalism and real journalism doesn't pay. Okay. It doesn't pay to tell people that judges are corrupt. It doesn't pay to tell people that the system that we are living in is so beyond belief. Can I say these words on your, in your Don't worry. I'll I'm just sorry. put, I'll just put SpongeBob. You know, that will sound <laughs> over it. Don't worry about it. All right. I'll, I'll come up with a different word. <laughs> go crazy. Go, no, 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 go, no, go crazy. I, I want so, you to be as free as possible. <laughs> it's so, our system is so corrupt. And, and that's not what journalists want you to know. And when you start reporting on how corrupt our system is, you will get demonetized. You yeah. will get shadow banned. You will be deleted. My channel on YouTube has been monetized for 10 years. I just got demonetized recently because I have been speaking out against uh, pride. I call it cringe month. And I have been, apparently I bullied an entire month. I didn't know you could bully the month of June, but I have done it. I'm very proud of that. And by me- The irony, you're proud of being proud. Yes, I'm very Continue. proud of bullying pride. <laughs> I, I, the irony, yeah. The point, I, you're not allowed to speak out on the platforms anymore about adults sh shaking their naked genitals in front of children. You're not allowed to say that that's wrong and bad anymore. I've been completely silenced and shut down because I've been very effectively pointing out with my homosexual friends who also feel the same way that I do, who also feel that they don't want anything to do with pride because it's become such a degenerate, disgusting mess. You're not allowed to say that because Vanguard and uh, you know BlackRock and none of those those organizations that own Google and whatever, they don't want you to say that because they have an agenda and we all know what that agenda is. All we have to do is look at Epstein, what's his name? Epstein. Because what, why has his little black book not been published? And why hasn't anybody in it been arrested? We know that Jeffrey Epstein was running a child trafficking ring on an island which supposedly the feds crawled all over and got everything off the computer, but no one has been arrested for it besides him and his girlfriend. Does that make any friggin' sense to any of you? And now we have this major push to sexualize children and to make people believe that nudity in front of children, giving children pornography, starting way back when, when I wrote this book, putting porn in front of kids, is perfectly okay. And anybody who says otherwise, you're gonna be shut down, you're gonna be silenced, you're gonna be shadow banned, demonetized. They're after my channel, it's gonna get deleted. The good news is that Megan Fox Investigates is not only on YouTube, but I'm on BitChute and Rumble. Every single one of my videos, as far as I know, at least in the last couple of years has been preserved. So if they delete me, I still exist. I'm also on Locals, which is meganfox.locals.com. And they're great, they, they're not gonna, they're not gonna, shadow ban us and they're not going to stop us from speaking it's the only free speech platform left out there rumble bit shoot and and locals and look i'm not going to stop saying it i'm not going to stop saying that naked people should keep their junk in their pants in public taylor lorenz the bob woodward of um, <laughs> um <laughs> tay -tay. oh don't get me started on tay tay <laughs> When, when she said that she was a Bob Woodward, I was like, okay, what did Bob Woodward start? And a lot of the things that he stood for is what I always perceive journalism to be. And what I'm seeing nowadays, it, as you've said, it seems to be a massive depart departure from that because what you did during the Deb V. Her trial, and I think it was you and Jessica Krauss, you two were the outliers that I did not expect and me even saying just across names like she's like the boogie woman right boogie woman <laughs> of right. uh, of this case because of how they have painted her in in the documentaries but she was the one that pretty much if i'm not mistaken latched onto your article yeah put it up there into the main and your article was poignant not only did you break the story in regards to the sexual assault cases that was with it's i i, I hope i got the right one but the, the sexual assault cases in regards to her new pr manager yeah, 10 shane. days we call him david grab ass shane that's <laughs> that's his name he tried to sue me 
by the way. I know. Uh, oh, that. Yeah. I was about to get. To, I was about to get to that because, yeah. because uh, like, I looked at that and and I'm like, she she amplified it, and then other newspapers picked up on it and was blowing it up during trial. My job is to force them to report it. So when they so take wait, the story wait, 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 and they don't give me any yeah. credit, I'm fine with it because I laugh. I sit and I laugh and I go, ha ha, I had it first. <laughs> and I showed you, I made you report this and you didn't want to. And, and that's great. That's a great feeling. I, I feel like I've succeeded. If I find something and I force the mainstream press to report it, for instance, one of the biggest stories I ever broke was the illegal alien who raped the 10 year old little girl that they used as a tool to to try to say that the fall of Roe v. Wade was the end of the world. And, and all of a sudden there's a 10 year old rape victim who was pregnant and had to have an abortion and they claimed she wasn't allowed to have it in Ohio. So they had to take her, they had to traffic her across state lines to Indiana and give it to her there. What I discovered through that, my investigation into that, because I'm like, there's red flags all over this article. For one, here's, here's a great breakdown of how to find a fake news story. The story had no discernible details in it. It did not answer the questions, who, what, why, when, and where. They were all missing. We had maybe the where, we had no who, we had no what, we had no in, no police investigation whatsoever was reported. And this is a 10 year old pregnant rape victim. That's a huge story in the state of Ohio. That's a huge, that's like you, you round up the posse and you go find the guy that did this because that's Ohio, you know, like Ohio has a death penalty for that kind of thing. So there's no way that there's no investigation and what kind of reporter it skips over entirely the investigation into the rapist. So that was my first red flag. I was like, why is there no, no reporting here about who did this crime? And the second thing was the story got picked up so quickly and, and repeated around the world within a matter of days. I have an Excel spreadsheet where I tracked it. I tracked how fast it went. And it was a matter of hours that this story went around the world. That does not happen organically. OK, it was one media company, by the way, that started spreading it all over its different papers and it, it owns all these papers in all these different places. And so it was immediately, you know, sent out to all these things. On per they want to get the clicks and they want to go. They're the drive bys. They want to get the clicks and move on to the next one. Okay, they're so not sending a, a, an investigative journalist into fact check a story that came from the Indianapolis Star. They're literally just going to reprint it, add a couple of their own paragraphs and move on. And they know this. Activists know this about the press, which is why the press must change. It's why journalism must change. Journalists must be inquisitive. Journalists must question everything, everything. So this is the, because you, you, you brought up activism. And that is something I've noticed growing a lot in, in in the media, not just not just in the media, but especially within this case of Debbie Heard, because every time we read um, anything to do with this case, it's all about uh, TikTok on trial. It's all about misogyny. It's all about right wing. For some reason, I don't because this is the probably the only case that I saw a unification of centrist Republicans. Democrats, right wing and left wing is what I'm trying to say. We saw mm -hmm. a kind of a unification and now everyone's back to their own fang factions, which is what I found weird to see. It's like almost a gaslighting that everything that we saw did not exist. It, it seems like there's advocacy type of, of, of reporting and then there is factual based reporting, which what is the larger message that, that is being sent here if it's in terms of activism is it to uh, it, it, let's look at it in, ter in terms of act activism for a second in in regards to a specific case why are they trying so hard to rehabilitate amber heard oh who in my opinion if you're gonna try and rehabilitate amber heard why stop there why not just go and try and rehabilitate Adolf Hitler, who has died, and you know, 
bring him back and say no he was that might actually... be the first time i've heard anybody compare amber heard to hitler <laughs> <laughs> and i don't hate it i'm not mad like, why I'm not, not mad try and reha- why not try and rehabilitate jeffrey Dahmer? i can tell you uh, why yeah, was... i can tell you why they are doing it and and the reason all comes down to the me too movement which is nothing but a political movement okay it is more it Amber Heard damaged that movement. It, she destroyed it. Not just damaged it. So why that not was just it. The kick swan her out of the song. And like, uh, like, the swan. No, because that movement gave them power. Don't you understand? It, that's what it was all about in the first place, was power over others. The, these women were trying to take over Hollywood, right? They wanted to push out the Weinsteins, push out the old guard and take over. It was a power grab from the beginning. That's not to say that Weinstein isn't a scumbag. I was, uh, I, 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 I'm, glad, because, I'm glad you brought it back because I, because well, I thought to ask what, what... Is a scumbag, like yeah. that, that, and he's in jail or whatever, or went to jail. I don't know if he's still there, but, but yeah, he's a scumbag. But, and I'm sure tons of people in Hollywood are scumbags. Are you kidding? They're all on Jeffrey Epstein's list, okay? So let's not, let's not pretend there. But so, this was so, always a power grab. It wasn't about it wasn't about protecting women. It isn't about it's not. And Amber Heard, if you know, if you remember, tried to set herself up as a Me Too advocate. I, she I was working vividly. with she was working with the Me Too lawyer, Roberta Kaplan. Yep. Roberta Kaplan was one of her lawyers in the yep. beginning of this. Time's and up. Roberta Kaplan even dropped her. When, when you when Roberta Kaplan drops you, you have a problem. Look, uh, the, the reason the media is trying so hard or some people in the media is trying so hard to rehab Amber's image is because they have lost they have lost the power that came with the Me Too movement. It is gone and Amber destroyed it. Amber destroyed anyone's willingness to believe that women don't lie. Women do lie and we should know this. We should know this. No one should have to tell you this, but we this has been, been we had a moment so- of insanity. <laughs> we had a moment of, ins- of mass insanity where people actually started to believe that women should be given more deference when it comes to their stories that they tell than anybody else but which which is really weird in 2023 because it doesn't fly now because we don't even know what a woman is anymore so so which women are we talking about i mean the ones with dicks or the what so do the ones with dicks then get the believe all women hashtag too it's very it would be very confusing me too had to die Trying, because it's all gender you're trying to get based. Me canceled, aren't you? You're trying. <laughs> Sorry, I I can't help it. I no, no, this is why. It. I listen, tell the truth. I'm not worried about getting canceled. I I truly do not care. But this is the overarching point because Amanda Amanda De Cardine did not even testify on her behalf. She left at the same time Kaplan did. So again, I, I like again, I this is one of those cases that i do not understand why especially penske media and we'll and let's let's talk about this for a minute what do you know about penske media nothing i i don't think i know anything about rolling that. stone variety and Fate oh do they Deadline. own just roll oh i didn't realize that they were all owned by the same company but that makes yeah. sense what mm-hmm. we were doing on youtube is real court reporting we sat there and we watched every damn minute I w- what I w- they do yeah is walk into a courtroom sit there for two hours i've watched it happen because i've reported from inside courtrooms i've watched it happen i've watched nbc come in and i'm sitting there all day they come in for two hours. Were you they, t- well, they sit there, not in that court, but I've covered other Oh, courts, yeah, no, no, other, no. Other of, stories. Of course, you said, yeah, but you, I uh, watch them. Sorry, they you, come sorry. in, they type their little story as they're sitting there, and they get up and they leave. They don't sit there for the eight hours. They're not there. We had people in the courtroom at the Johnny and Amber trial, uh, all of LawTube, right? There were so many LawTubers in the courtroom who were reporting on the reporters. And the reporters, from NBC and other places would come in for two hours a day and leave. So tell me, how do they report accurately when they didn't hear the evidence? They didn't sit there for it. They got in, they got the story they wanted because they have an already, they've made up their minds about who's at fault. So they come in, they write their little story that matches their narrative and then they leave. That's not court reporting. 
I don't know what you call that, but it's not court reporting. And you, and this is why Nick Ricada is so important. That's why LawTube is so important because Nick Ricada destroyed the media during Rittenhouse, and he destroyed their ability to do that anymore. They cannot do it. Now, they thought they could with the Johnny and Amber trial. They tried it again. I can't believe they tried it again, but they got embarrassed and destroyed for doing it again because there were those of us who were there, who were watching every single second, mm -hmm. and we knew that they were telling untruths. That umbrella guy deserves an entire, like uh, so much credit for this as well because he had been in, I mean, he he got named in the trial for talking to Johnny Savoyer, you know, for Adam, what's his name? Um, and uh, yeah, Waldman. He had been on this case for years before anybody else. And that's real journalism. He did some great work bringing forward the tapes, bringing out the real story, which is that Amber Heard is a husband abusing abuser the, oh. and a liar. That we are now going through some kind of gynocentrism within society. I understand. I understand that you know we want to advocate for women. I understand all of that. There, there is the activism that that's there, and I'm not. Even, I'm not. Even Hard going to do to... that when you can't define what a woman is, though. <laughs> what I'm going to say is, what about the next generation? Because the only people that are going to be, in my honest opinion, harmed by all this is always the, the people. 20, living 20 to 30 years, maybe even 10, down the line. What message do they want to send to them that you could be beaten up by your spouse? You have proof. This is just all happening by accident because Johnny Depp's tapes and all of that, it was by complete accident. It was by chance that he went to a therapist and the therapist suggested record mm -hmm. it all, listen back to the conversations and try to rationalize, you know, try and calm it down from there because mm -hmm. if you hear yourself talk maybe you can actually reach an equilibrium somewhere if that didn't happen you actually realize that we would not know who she is we would not even know how bad she is so mm. what message are you sending that you could be that fortunate and even after being that fortunate even after all that you won't be believed does the yeah. media even think about anything of this sort do like, do they have a moral compass no <laughs> media with a moral compass that that's funny <laughs> no they don't have a moral compass. do you remember the song by the guy who was in the eagles and then he went uh, it was dirty laundry the lyrics to this song descri describes exactly the state of the media and you know, this is, this is, let me read you some of this. I make my living off the evening news. Just give me something, something I can use. People love it when you lose. They love dirty laundry. <laughs> well, I could have been an actor, but I wound up here. I just have to look good. I don't have to be clear. Come and whisper in my ear and give me dirty laundry. Kick them when they're up. Kick them when they're down. Kick them when they're up. Kick them when they're down. Kick them all around. We got the bubble-headed bleach blonde. She comes on at five. She can tell you about the plane crash with a gleam in her eye. It's interesting when people die, give us dirty laundry. Can we film the operation? Is the head dead yet? You know, the boys in the newsroom got a running bet. Get the widow on the set. We need dirty laundry. You don't really need to find out what's going on. You don't really want to know how far it's gone. Just leave well enough alone and eat your dirty laundry. This song just tells you everything you need to know about the media. We can do the innuendo. This is a good verse. We can dance and sing. And when it's said and done, we haven't told you a thing. We all know that crap is king. Give us dirty laundry. Dirty little secrets, dirty little lies. We got our dirty little fingers and everybody's pie. We love to cut you down to size. We love dirty laundry. That is the state of media and it always has been and it always will be and there are only a few people who care about the truth who care to dig and look for facts no matter where they land on either side and i would like to think that over the years i have become better at putting aside my personal feelings about a story people are very reticent to see men as victims of domestic yeah. violence 
And I think part of it is because of our our stereotypes, right? We we still rely on these stereotypes about men and men being stronger, mask, and they are they are stronger physically. But think about how men are trained. They're trained to never hit a hit a girl. Yeah. You don't hit a girl. Why not? And if a girl is hitting you, the only thing that men think they can do is either flee or restrain. Try and play the other side here for a minute. You are working for the Rolling Stones, right? You have sipped their Kool-Aid and you have understood their ideology. When you see someone like Amber Heard, just put yourself in your shoes. How would you approach this subject? Like reporting this subject, would you try and again I'm I'm begging you to please put yourself in your shoes. In if their you, shoes, you mean in the in, in the in the media mainstream Yes. Would yeah. you how would you report this? Okay, I'm gonna try and think like Tay Tay. <laughs> think like Tay Tay. Would you would it be, <laughs> please uh, actually I'm not gonna say Well, probably whatever my editor told me to do. And and that's really the truth. The truth of the matter is the editor is going to set the tone for how, what they want reported. If I'm gonna pitch a story, I'm gonna pitch a story that she's a women's rights advocate who has done all this human you know, rights work and oh, look at she's a UN ambassador and she's done all these things. Even within the charity work. <laughs> well, I mean, if you looked at it from a very surface point of view, I would probably sprinkle that in about, oh, she's you know, a women's rights advocate. She's advocating against domestic violence. That's yeah. all, those are all good things, right? They're good things. And so that goes in the good column. And, and so they put people into these columns. You're either good or you're bad. And if you're in the good column, you get the, the glowing report. Also, don't underestimate the possibility that almost all of the articles being written about Amber Heard right now are paid for by her PR firm. Okay, because that's a thing that no one wants to talk about. But PR firms, I have actual evidence of this in my DMs because I had one reach out to me and try to get me to pay for a glowing article about myself. And I was like, okay. I, I, what? Right. No, no, thank you. I don't need that. I don't want it. And uh, I would never be in something like Isn't that. Isn't that no, a conflict of interest? Well, well, of course, but that's what PR firms do. So a PR firm will buy a space in a magazine or an or a newspaper. Yeah. And they will write an article that looks like an article that was but it's not an article. It's literally like an ad and they paid 5,000 or 10,000 dollars for it. And they that's what her op-ed in the Washington Post was. Amber Heard's op-ed in the Washington Post was bought and paid for. She paid for that. She paid to be able to put that in the paper. It wasn't the Washington, the Washington Post wasn't like, hey, let's let's have Amber Heard come be a guest columnist. No, you can buy space in a newspaper and make it look like you are somebody important. Uh, this is what PR firms do. And it's the reason why she had the whole like, you know, the pledge didn't donate thing going so that she could have that out there. That was all for just for her press. So that was for good press no no okay. I, I no i completely i i've done business management before even going into like i know about about the stakeholders i even businesses are even told to have lobbyists so that they can have political right. political power sorry a say or a voice within the political system so that they can get past laws so that they can get laws passed in their that's favorable to their business this is not this is not so they, this concept is not even far-fetched. It's actually would be factual. And a lot of papers are set up just for that purpose. There's a massive difference between ABC News, there's a massive difference between BBC News, Sky News, all those news channels, to People, People, Rolling Stones, all those things, then filtering yep. down to the blogs. Because everything that you said in terms of who she picked to go for, it is absolutely strange that it's not... ABC is is not, but it's Entertainment Tonight, People, Rolling Stone, LA Week, yeah, or Us Insider, yeah, all of these. It's it's all th these are all PR. They're just PR landing spots. Okay, really. So can you go into a bit more detail in regards to the PR? What you mean by PR landing spots? What okay, I'll read you the message that I got from one of these people. Okay, you want to hear? 
Okay, and this was, she was trying to sell me a, a spot in LA Weekly and LA Wire and Us Insider. So those are three that I, I meant to write about this and I never did. Hello, Megan. I hope this message finds you well. As a PR professional, I'm always on the lookout for innovative leaders who are making a difference in their respective fields. Your work as an award-winning journalist and author caught my attention, and I believe you would be a great fit for our upcoming feature in LA Weekly, Top 10 Visionaries to Look Out for in 2023. We are looking for individuals who are pushing boundaries and making waves in their industries. Your experience and expertise would be a valuable addition to our list. LA Weekly has a wide readership, and this feature would give you exposure to a broader audience. If you are interested in being featured in our publication, please let me know. We can discuss the details further. So I wrote back. I knew exactly what this was. I wrote back. I said, yeah, I'm interested to know how it works. You're a PR firm, so you place articles in magazines for people and they pay you to do it for good press or whatever, right? W what do people pay for these placements? She goes, yes, that's correct. Prices vary depending on the publication. Here are some examples of the recent press campaigns I've hosted so you can get an idea of what this feature is going to look like. She sends me three articles, one in LA Weekly, one in LA Wire, top 10 entre entrepreneurs to look out for in 2023 and one in us insider placements for la weekly are 500 dollars, and we have three spots left so i click on these articles and they're all so it's so terrible it's all a bunch of douchebags you know like just just awful these people are paying 500 dollars to get their name in some publication this is not how journalism works you know i've done spots i've done articles about people that I find interesting or I find relevant. I've never, I don't take a payment from those people to do it. I get paid by PJ Media if my articles, you know, get clicks, you know, if people are interested in reading them, that's how you get paid. You get See, paid because readership wants to read it. How do I pause now that I have this kind of information and this context, how do I pause through like for example, Johnny Depp at Cannes, or the, even this Jonathan Majors movie, the Majors story. Mm -hmm. We've covered the interest groups, kind of. Now we're looking at the paid PR, right? How mm -hmm. do I pass through a massive event like Depp appearing for the first time at Cannes Festival, and the articles that paint him in a negative light, and the articles that are now painting Amber Heard in a positive light? All belong to Penske Media, by the way. Just want to put out deadline, for example. Well, the like, first thing you got to do is find out what is she still using David Shane? I believe so. He scrubbed everything, so we don't know anymore. So we but... don't know. Well, <laughs> the first thing you would do, I think, is find out if her PR firm that she's currently using has a relationship with Pesky. Uh, yeah, no, no, he does. He does. Yeah, it's from he used to work for It's Sick, it, It's Sick Industries or whatever, like a PR firm. And they actually had contact with, I don't want to get this wrong. Damn, I'm not going to say it. But I'm not going to say it. No. But yeah, that's what I would I, know, I mean, I know what I you believe, mean. Though. I know what you mean. I, I believe it's all paid for PR. I think that the, the PR firm, Amber Heard's PR firms, are planting these stories. So, like if it's The Guardian, for instance, because I, let's say it's like one of these bigger ones, like yeah, The yeah, Telegraph yeah. or The Guardian. Yeah. So, a PR. A professional will have contacts within media. I have yeah. some of them as my contacts who reach out to me who say, Hey, I have this story. Are you interested in it? Yeah, most yeah. of the time, most of the time I turn them down because I'm not usually interested in anybody's PR. Sometimes if it's newsworthy, I will sometimes I will use it. So most likely they are either selling op-eds so, right, so they'll have an op-ed already written and they'll be selling that to a newspaper. Or they will have a contact at a PR, and I had one with the dogs on death row story, I had one, one experience with this where I hooked up with somebody who had a contact with a, with a journalist mm. through PR at the Washington Post. And so we were able to get the Washington Post interested in the dogs on death row story. I got to see it from the backside for the first time ever, mm. you know, as watching watching people I was working with use their channels to like, be like, okay, we need to get this story in this paper and let's do it this way. I know this guy, yeah. you know? 
So that happens sometimes too, where it's like, well, if you can get the reporter interested and the reporter was interested because it was actually a really good newsworthy story. It was like, oh, dogs on death row. This is, and they get off. I mean, it, it was like, it's a heartwarming thing. We can make a movie about this. It's so good. Look, all of it, like she had a campaign planned against Johnny from the beginning and it, it and she recorded things on purpose so that she could release it to TMZ. She and she re released all kinds of stuff. She got caught releasing, you know, telling TMZ where she was going to be at the courthouse. She, you know, the, this not, whole thing even... has been. But but it was a great illustration, though, of how media really works, yeah. because this is how it works. It works yeah. through influence and through power and don't underestimate by the way the reporters who are very starstruck they love to be known by stars and they like to be friends with stars and so they will tell whatever story the stars want because they want those invitations to the parties tay tay loves her parties she loves getting on her little gold glitter dress and going to her, her insider cocktail parties no. And, you know, yeah. they love that and they don't want to alienate themselves from those sources because they're getting perks. They're mm -hmm. getting perks. Every feature that she's done in magazines like Alia, for example, that's a proper fashion magazine. So how do they work? How do they oh, work? Oh, I think Allure is the same way. Allure is no better than Variety. It's no better than, it's the same type of thing. So, and I guarantee you that they are taking PR pieces. Okay, so you. so even though they are a magazine, sorry, even though they're yeah, they more of a fashion... They got to fill those pages. And believe me, nowadays, it is people don't buy magazines. They're online. So yeah. they're, the entire journalism uh, industry is hurting. Okay. Because no one buys newspapers, no one buys magazines. Everything's online and everything's okay. accessible for so, free. So how do they pay the bills? So they. So act, this is why they the buy money. stories. So I'm glad that you said that's a PR puff piece because it doesn't make sense why NME, which is I know this because they are very big within the music scene. Like they are like they're like the source. The source is it's a music magazine. When I see NME talking about I'm a, I'm a herd. I gotta, I gotta ask the one question: What is a music magazine? Why is a music, ma a music magazine talking about a movie star that has never made music in her yeah. life? Because never they promised. Here's why, and I'm looking. At, they, they promised him an interview with her personally, and he got one because he's quoting her directly. Okay. Whoever okay. this person is, and who's writing it, Chris Edwards. So okay. it's a man. And when a when a male journalist that nobody pays attention to yep, 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 gets yep. a call from a PR company and says Amber Heard wants to talk to you, you know he's going to get to sit down with a movie starlet. Yeah, why not? Yep. You know, and he's a journalist. He's looking for things to write. Yep. He's looking for things that people will click on. And hey, Amber Heard is still very clickable. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So but so that, that got put there because a PR guy called. Enemy and said we've got uh, we've got Amber Heard. She's got something to say. She'll sit down with one of your reporters. Want to do it? Okay. And they go, yeah, sure. All right. So my question yeah. is, my question is in regards to what you just shared with me in terms of you know um, the fact that they want this interview because she's a very clickable person. Mm -hmm. uh, um, they're gonna make that money through ads. I'm guessing they are already a big brand. They so, make some of it through ads, but they, they make, make a lot more of it through clicks. So they make it through clicks and ads. Where, where does her PR pay for this, by the way? Pay for this service? Well, is they she, might not have. They might not have paid for that one. But right? this one. They, All right. They might not have paid for that one. They might have just paid for it by giving access to her. Do you okay. see? That's a form of payment also. Okay. So giving access to the to the, I, I the star, yeah. to the journalist who never gets laid and probably looks like a guy, you know, he looks like a neck beard. He wants that, he wants that interview. Okay. He's gonna get to say he sat down with Amber Heard. Okay, so the reason why I asked that question is, is I, I believe this context is very important. She just done a, a film festival. So she has, in business sense, she actually does have leverage, right? You just done a, a, yeah. a, a, a movie that is, pretty much being talked about on social media by the, the supporter base and is being talked about by reputable sources that I'm sure enemy are not stupid. They know that, that Penske Media, that she's kind of in bed with them. So based on those, if she was to 
make a transaction with Penske Media, for example, and pay them to push her up with these three reputable sources, you know, Deadline, Page Six, all of those, you know, and Twitter accounts like Pop Crave, or you know, all those pop things, all like like all all, all of those, you know, accounts all talking about her. It it would make sense that now on the 29th of June that this guys would actually pay her because there's traction now coming in. Is, well, yeah, that, they, is they, that how they, they want, think? In, yes, in the that's media? how they... Yeah, well, if you get your name out there, right, and you're kind of trending, now yeah. you have a greater chance that journalists will approach you or that, or that you have an easier time getting more media. But look at the... I'll, I'll show you an example, though, of a totally paid piece for okay. her. All right. Well, and that would be the People article perfect. that came out Amber Heard's In the Fire team talks her resilience after Johnny Depp trial. It didn't change her by Jen Janu in People. Now, almost everything in People, I believe, I think everything that People writes is a is paid PR. I can't prove it for a fact because <laughs> I haven't worked there, but I'm very sure that this is that this is all paid stuff. Is that, now, this, wait, is that this the one is that has the headline that says Amber Heard's In the Fire director says she has an yep. Yep, that one, exclusive. Yep. All right, so it's, when it says, yeah. okay, when a, when a piece, when an article says exclusive, what does that mean? Well, not much. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 sometimes it means something. It okay. means you have an exclusive, you got the first interview, but sometimes they just use it as a, as a click word, you okay. know, I mean. Because especially these types of magazines, sometimes you'll read through the whole thing and you'll be like, well, what was exclusive about that? Like it, it, media doesn't have to tell you the truth. Yeah. You know, they, 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 but this, I don't know, I guess this might have been the first interview that this team heard. So Amber Heard, this is what it says. Amber Heard is receiving some serious kudos from her in the fire director and co-stars. The 37-year-old actress made an appearance at the 69th Terramina Film Festival, Festival in Italy over the weekend alongside the movie's director, Connor Allen, where he told Deadline he's so happy that while Heard went through so, something so awful, the experience didn't change her as a person. So if we go over to Deadline, so Deadline was the first one to do this, and then people just picked it up and repeated it. And I think that that people most likely was given that heads up by her PR. I mean, just, just, and probably paid. They had to have paid them. I don't know why they would repeat the story. It's not interesting. There's nothing new here. It's just one of those things that somebody interviewing the director from Deadline, he said that thing and then her PR company picked up on it and made sure it got spread everywhere possible. Okay. Right? So, so Somebody so, says something positive about somebody. So as the PR firm, you're like, oh, get that quote into people. Let's get it into US Weekly. Let's get it into, you know, as many as we can. So they call all their contacts and they make sure they all write. You have to justify her paying them yeah. also. So this is a justification for her PR team to say, all right, here's all the things we did for you this month. We got you in people. We got you in you, Us Weekly. We got you in all these Double publications. Salary. They're all they're all positive articles for you. And then they're also at the same time monitoring her likability factors, right? So they do these polls and they, they find out how are people responding to these articles. So they not only put them out there, but then they find out how, how does the public react to this? Is it positive or is it negative? So if your positivity rating then goes up a few points, well, now you're justified in getting more of Amber Heard's money because you just gave her value for what she paid you to do. If you do get sued, let's say you 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 did use an omnipotent um, source and you do get sued, is it something that you would, is it something that legally you would have to hand that uh, paper over that you do have, yes, I got this documentation, etc. Or that, like, does the law actually allow you to be like- That's a good question because I haven't been through it. Okay. I know that we're allowed to protect our sources legally Okay. So that's a good question. I don't think we would have to turn over our source. Okay. I think you could, I think it's possible to show that to a judge, possibly, but I don't think we're supposed to. I think you, as a journalist, if you are using an unnamed source because it's a whistleblower of some kind, we have the absolute right to, to say no, even yeah. to a judge. So that would be a difficulty. Um, 
because you don't want to give up your source to protect yourself from a lawsuit. Most likely though, see, that's never happened because everything we've printed is true. <laughs> that's so, and those sources and like your, the targets, they know it's true. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they, they're not going to court over something they know is true. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I'm, yeah. You know that David Kane, by the way, I never heard from him again. After <laughs> Cease and desist. I was, I was literally about to ask, I was literally about to ask you like, um, I was literally about to go back to that and just, I, I, and ask you like an hyperbic around him, but it's great that you never heard from her again. But I yeah. was gonna say, I'm not sure actually, because I don't think the woman that I was in habit actually came forward was actually a name source. I think she was anonymous from the Facebook she post. She was anonymous, and then she came out to the Guardian. She said, "I she just couldn't, uh, she didn't care. She was like, I don't care. Yeah. I'll, I'll say who who I am because this happened." Mm -hmm. um, you know, to me, it was different than like the Marilyn Manson accusers you know, yeah. who stand to make a fortune and a lifestyle change out of their accusations, you know, which are full of crap, um, <laughs> obviously. And it, I mean, anybody who watched that awful HBO documentary should have seen it. I watched the entire thing, Rising Phoenix or mm -hmm. Phoenix Rising. I watched the entire thing. And by the end of it, I was like, wait. I didn't see any evidence of any of this, nothing that you presented absolutely no evidence. All I heard was that a bunch of you as 19 and 20 year old adults got into a kinky relationship with a guy that you consented to for years. And then you regretted it five years later or 10 years later. And now you want to be famous because of it. That's not how any of this works. That you, I mean, to, oh, to... he tied me up like, <laughs> You're I'll dating be, Marilyn Manson. This it's new one me, with but, Jonah Hill. But, it, Jonah Hill's girlfriend. She comes out a year later <laughs> with some text of stuff that he said that she didn't like. And suddenly that's abuse. Like, wait a minute. But you left him. And like, you're fine now. And like, there was nothing going on. He just said, don't post thirst trap pictures. And she's like, no. And he's like, okay, then we're breaking up. And she's like, abuse. And it's that emotional abuse one that is so hard to pinpoint because one person's emotional abuse is another person's could you just not post nude pictures of yourself <laughs> online like that's abuse so anything any one woman can turn anything into abuse um med or you know emotional abuse if they want to i uh, to me i'm sorry for laughing but that's grave i i shouldn't laugh it's actually really great well you can't yeah guys don't ask your wife not to post nudies anymore. Just leave. That's abuse. Just, just, just break up. Don't discuss. Or no. Go no, for you, a divorce. You no, you can't even break up. You can't get a divorce because that's abuse too. No, you can't. You're supposed to just put up with it. You're supposed to empower her. She's empowered now because she's showing her tits online. Wait, she's I can't empowered even leave that situation to... that I find abusive? Yeah, you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> As a man, no, you're stuck. <laughs> You can't. You, women can abuse you all they want. You've done it. You've done work on this, boy. Oh yeah, over a, a fifteen months, approximately. Uh, the latest one, though, it was just recently because we this had an is update. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> this is very, like well, like this uh, is what destroyed. This is what destroyed me as a journalist. I don't think I'll ever be the same after this, and I don't think I want to do it anymore. Really. Yeah. So what? I'm so done. what do you want to do then? Like after this? I'm waiting tables right now. That's what I'm doing. In bartending. You're not gonna run for office? Oh hell no. You're not going no. to go no, into law? No, I'm gonna disappear. Damn. So I don't. Megan, there's too much you're unloading on me. So I'm we sorry. went from we went from I'm not I'm I, I, I was there right. And I'm no, gone, no longer going to vote. And then we went from, I'm no longer going to vote to I'm no longer going to do journalism because of all the things I've come to find out. And then, and then, and, 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 and then we go to I'm going to disappear. Oh, this is too much, man. This is too much. Work. Well, look, let me, let me explain something. I've been doing this for over 20 years. Okay. Yeah. When I started out as a 20-year-old, so revved up about my political beliefs and wanting to change things. Yeah. And uh, over the years, I have discovered that there is no changing anything. And it does you no good to hold on to a rock when you're falling over a cliff and it's falling with you. 
You know, it just, just does no, it does you no good. We're falling off a cliff. Uh, you know, grabbing onto the person who's falling next to you isn't going to help anything. And um, for my own, for my own emotional health and well-being, I have to take a break. And I have, I have been immersed in people's darkest hours for 20 years. And when I see people's darkest hours, it doesn't get worse than child sex abuse and child trafficking. And the things that I've seen, I have secondary PTSD, I think. Um, and it has begun to affect my health in a way that I can't, that I have to recover from because I have children and a family and they have uh, sacrificed a lot over the last 20 years, including my long suffering husband um, in order for me to help other people. And it has really, I'm not going to lie. It, it has affected me. And there's a darkness there that I don't need to live in. I, I have a great life. I have a beautiful life. I've, I've given 20 years of my life to trying to help shed some light on some of this darkness. And I, I need help. Or I need somebody else to pick it up. I need somebody else to care uh, because I can't care for everybody. I can't. I have to. So what's happened to me starting in December was that I started having chronic pain uh, in my neck and shoulders. And it got so bad and it was lasting months and months and months. And I had gone to doctors and physical therapists and everything else. Um, that I was unable to do anything uh, except cry and wish for death, basically. Um, <laughs> so my physical therapist recently, uh, maybe a month ago, said, okay, you really need to stop sitting in front of a keyboard. And that's journalism is mostly sitting in front of a keyboard, you know, and, and writing. I write thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of words. Um, if you had looked at my content and you just, you were blown away by what's in the Missouri catalog, right? That was 15 months. And I was also writing on top of that other columns every day, three, four columns a day. So the combination of the physical work of uh, carpal tunnel and sitting in front of a computer and typing and being for hours a day and the emotional um, problem of being subjected to the darkest things that humanity can do to one another. Uh, I have a pinched nerve in my spine. My spine's degenerating. And um, I, so I'm having now not just like mental, you know, hardship, but now physical. So my PT said, you've got to move. The spine likes to move and you've got to move. You have to walk every day. And I can't just go walk for three miles a day. Like that's just not in my, that's not part of where, what I can do. So I decided, I'm like, well, I can go back to waiting tables. Cause I used to do that. And I was really good at it. And I will be walking. I'll be walking and getting paid because if I have to stop writing, I, I need to get paid. Um, so I'm on a, I'm on a hiatus right now. I'm writing only about five articles a month. Um, and so far this month, I've only written one, so I got to get on it. But uh, <laughs> but I have in the last month, my neck is probably 50 to 60 percent better. My pain is about is, is almost gone. Um, I still have tightness and like I can feel it like pulling, but it's not the pain that it was radiating everywhere. So it's working and I just need to do this. I need to get better because I have three children. Uh, who need me and and my husband who needs me to be a wife and a mom and be concerned about their issues and their problems, you know, and and I get it. We don't have the kind of problems that I've been working with other people. The people who I work with have problems that you can't even imagine. Um, but it's I've done I think I've done enough for now. I I'm just not I'm not able to for whatever reason I I don't have the ability to not be affected by the sadness because in all reality and I hate saying this out loud because it makes me feel like a failure. 
you know no one has been like very few people have been helped you're not you're not very you're, few people well, have they... actually made it have beat this system i've i've had like of, of the hundreds of people that i've reported their stories maybe you're not two three maybe two or three people have actually won against the system and there are hundreds none of those people in st louis have a happy ending not one you, you are not because you're not a failure because you like, like i said you're the one that's bringing media attention to it and what you know what i was trying to say earlier was the people that should be covering this and just picking this up from you guys are the mainstream media to really push put this in the mainstream and say look listen this is an actual problem let's fix it so because that's how laws are reformed they ignored it Th that ignored that's that's what I'll i'm saying you, like, let me tell you without, i had a press yeah there was a press conference that i covered in st louis with all those parents they held a press conference outside the courthouse and there were at least 25 to 30 people there telling and every news camera in st louis was there every channel and they sat there and they filmed these people tell these horrific stories of what was done to them by the same guardians ad litem by the same psychologists who were falsely diagnosing them with with uh disorders they didn't have they listened to this and not one of them reported any of it on the news i we sat and watched i will never forget it me and kenneth rosa who was the at the time he was the media coordinator for uh, the father's rights movement, Michael Volpe, Avita Tolu, who was the lawyer that broke the story that was the whistleblower. We're, we're sitting there watching the TV. We're waiting for it. This is it. Are they going to, are they going to air it? And do you know what they aired? They aired a story about the Bishop coming to bless the tractors and a snake on a can of baked beans in South Carolina at a target not I, one word okay so when you say and i'm telling you this i understand i'm not giving up but i can't do it on my own i i i just can't and there's and there's no without that help of the mainstream press to pick up a story and care about it there was one outlet in missouri that interviewed Evita Tolu and two of the other mothers, and they did an, an eight minute television uh, expose on their allegations, but they never followed up. They, KMOV never followed up. I think it was KMOV. I, I could be wrong, but I maybe. All right, don't quote me on that. It was one of the, I can't remember the, the, the name you're of fine, the station, you're fine. You're fine. but it was one. It was one of them, just one. And that was before. Uh, the press conference. So they had aired that. Then all the parents that this happened to came out of the woodwork to say, it happened to me too. It happened to me too. And they had the press conference and then no one followed up. No one, not one person. It, it was like, what? So I was the only one and Mike Volpe, me and Mike Volpe were the only two and we're independent investigators and we don't have the budgets. Okay. We don't have, I, I, I crowdfunded money so i could go to st louis buy a plane ticket I, I you know i stayed with evita like i didn't even get a hotel room i stayed at a stranger's house you know she's not a stranger anymore but like we don't have a staff we don't have we don't have the resources that these big corporate co corporate media do and i swear the reason why they put a kibosh on this story is because they all have lawyers and all the lawyers are connected in Missouri. They're all connected in, in St. Louis to the bar and everything else. And they're all talking to one another saying, do not air this story. You will get sued. That's what they're telling the networks. But there's no truth to it. They can't get sued for telling the truth and for doing their jobs. But the lawyers don't want them to do it. The lawyers, because they know they're involved in this scandalous, corrupt system the lawyers are saying, nope, we're going to get shut out by our favorite judges. Nope, we're never going to get what we need. We're going to get shut out if we tell these stories. We're going to get retaliated against. I know that's what's happening. I don't. I can't say I've got proof of it, but I'm sure that that's what is going on. There is you negative. cannot. <laughs> you cannot get corporate. You cannot get lawyers. Uh, like you can't get corruption in courts exposed 
through media companies that have teams of lawyers who are in the system. She's you, back. You that was a short <laughs> retirement. That was a short retirement. <laughs> I'm not. I know. Okay. You know what's funny? You're gonna laugh so hard. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm quitting. I don't want to do this anymore. So I go wa start waiting tables. I'm like, this is great. I'm gonna have. I don't have to think about anything. I don't have to do. All I gotta do is roll silverware and bring food and collect my tips. It's perfect. What happens? I get hired in a place where I have now discovered uh, what I think is theft. <laughs> and you know me, I'm like Nancy Drew in it. I'm like, hmm, well, what's going on here? And I said to my best friend, I'm like, I'm like, why the hell does this keep happening to me? I can't do anything without my life turning into a mystery novel. Why is it always that? Why is it always me that has to uncover this crap? <laughs> and then I can't just leave it alone. If yeah. I had not asked those questions and caused an uproar by saying, I think this might be fake. I think there might not be any kid. I think there might, this is just not even a story. And then it turns out, oh no, there is a kid. Oh, but this illegal alien rapist is the one who did it and they gave her back to him. That, 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 that was a big win. But for yeah. me, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, it's like, so Cindy Absluck said something to me the other day. She's one of the moms who's had one of the most terrific stories I've ever covered in CPS. And she's the one I met Billy Mintz through. I was telling her this the other night. She said, when I said, I don't think I've helped anyone. Like I just, no one is helped by this. She said, that's totally false because if I hadn't had you and the team that we built, I may have, I may have, you know, ended it all. And I couldn't have, I couldn't have gotten here and made it through jail, going to jail and without you guys being here and being on the phone and being with me and, you know, Megan so a lot, a lot of it is that, and I'll never, I mean, and, and that made me feel a little better. Cause I was like, well, that's probably true. I mean, if I had been in her situation and no one was, was believing me and the news was just calling me QAnon mom and just splashing my picture everywhere and no one believed me, I, I, I might have, I might off myself too. So, and other people have, this has happened. It literally just happened to one of the moms I worked with. Catherine Kasanoff went and did assisted suicide in Sweden because the courts have screwed her so badly. And she was someone I spent hours on the phone with. So when I tell you I've been through some shit with some people, it's not, it, it's just, it's insane. So, and it's, it's dark. Um, Megan, I could hug you. I could actually hug you. If I, if I was there, I, I would hug you. Because I'm a done... hugger. I would hug you too. <laughs> no, no, you've done, that's what I'm trying to say. You've done great work. And even with the little, the little time that, I, that I've gotten to know you, I'm, go I'm going to actually see your work. Like I said, it's remarkable. Like I've got so much. If I really wanted to like really look into this and be like, let's say that I'm, I, I've got a popularity of, I don't know who can I compare to. I don't, I don't know who can I aspire to. Idris Elba, for example. Let's say, let's say I got his popularity, and I look at your work, and I'm really passionate about it, and I'm like, yeah, that's a lot stronger than the mainstream media. I'm, that's true. You know, what I mean, true. maybe, maybe it's not necessarily that we need the mainstream media to pick up on it. Maybe we just need just people that are just credible, known. I'm not saying I, I am Idris ever, by the way. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that. But, uh, but I'm well, saying maybe we need people like that people. to look, look at it. My audience, oh, they're so amazing. These people are so amazing. They humble me every day. I, when I needed crowdfunding to get to St. Louis, I had it overnight. When I needed funding to sue a school board in Wabatosa, I needed $10,000. That's a lot of money. I had it in seven days. My audience is amazing. And so they give me sometimes that funding that I need to get work done. I needed $2,000 once for a FOIA request that a school was charging me to find out some crap. And they gave it to me in like two days. I, I'm so grateful for them. Uh, the Wauwatosa lawsuit is still going on. It's a free speech lawsuit. They, they mm. violated my right to speak at their meeting. Uh, that was a mistake because now Robert Barnes is suing them with me. And, um, and, and that was great. He, he decided to take it on. He said he would do it for cost, which was 10 grand. And then he'd take on the rest. And so my audience and the people who are interested in my work are amazing. 
and and I'm so grateful for every single one of them. And they they're with me on locals. I'm on meganfox.locals.com. They they they're there for me, and they make me feel amazing because it feels like people do care. I wish the media cared. I wish the mainstream media cared, but the American public and 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 the international public. Let's just face it. I've got Australians. I've got uh, Brits. I've got people in Poland. I've got people in Russia. I have people from all over the world watching this stuff and they care. And, yeah. and that makes me, that makes me very happy. So I'm grateful for that. Well, um, Megan, uh, I, I really appreciate that you sat down to me for, for, for the second time. I'm really appreciate, I really appreciate that you've been really candid and honest with me. If I'm being honest, I'm actually really, I'm really touched. I'm really touched. I, I am touched because I'm, I'm touched. You care to talk about it. I will always talk about, you know, whenever anybody asks me to talk about, um, especially the court stuff, the court corruption, that's the stuff I care about the most. I'm always willing to talk to anyone about it, anyone. Uh, and I do have, I like to have a lot of fun on my channel and stuff and, and, you know, do silly entertainment stuff as well, because that helps me stay sane. Um, but the stuff that I have worked on for so many years, you know, trying to root out this corruption, trying to sh shed a light, trying to make changes. Oh, I'll talk to anybody about it. And I just appreciate that you cared to ask. So thank no, you. No, it's, it's, I can't speak to the specifics, but it's very personal. It's very personal to me it's to even hear about um, children. I do appreciate that the time that you've given me today. Um, we'll definitely pick this up another time. Yeah, let's yeah. do it again. I, yes. I love talking to you. And I think that uh, I think you're terrific. I think that I think you're great. So I want to hug I, you now. Why are you I doing know. this to me? I know. I'm sorry, oh. but I think you're great. <laughs> I love your questions. I think we always have good talks oh. and it's good. I, I really appreciate I, I really appreciate you like uh, the the information that you share alone ugh, uh, it's just it's cutting me up but at the same time I'm like yes you need to hear this like because there are people in, in in the ground that you may not agree with yes you don't agree with you don't agree with the views that's fine that's 100% sure, right. okay you don't it's have totally to totally okay it's fine my favorite it's my fine. favorite friends but they're not favorite... nazis they're actually no, trying no. to do something <laughs> my favorite <laughs> friends <laughs> you know my favorite friends are are people who don't agree with me on on any issue because that that creates really great conversation right someone who agree and echo chambers are no fun that's why I don't like Truth Social and I don't like any of like conservative social media. I hate it. I think it's dumb. I like Twitter where it's like a war, where, <laughs> but we don't have to be, but we don't have to be a war. We can still like go have a beer together after we fight on Twitter, you know? Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you. <laughs> um, You're welcome.